Good evening again on Bank Holiday Sunday. Um, day's drawing to a close. The sun will be setting soon. Um, I hope you've had a lovely day. So we're up to chapter six now, which is called Puck. Maya drowsily from the day heat flew leisurely past the glare on the bushes in the garden into the cool, broad leaved shelter of a great chestnut tree. On the trodden sward in the shade under the tree stood chairs and tables, evidently for an outdoor meal. A short distance away gleamed the red tiled roof of a pe peasant's cottage with thin blue columns of smoke curling up from the chimneys. Now at last, thought Maya, she was bound to see a human being. Had she not reached the very heat of his realm? The tree must be his property and the curious wooden um, bits in the shade must belong to his hive. Something buzzed. A fly alighted on the leaf beside her. It ran up and down the green veining in little jerks. She couldn't see its legs move, and it seemed to be sliding about excitedly. Then it flew from one finger of the broad leaf to another, but so quickly and unexpectedly that you might have thought it hadn't flown, but hopped. Evidently, it was looking for the most comfortable place on the leaf. Every now and then, in the suddenest way, it would swing itself up in the air a short space and buzz as though something dreadful to untoward had occurred or as though it was animated by some tremendous purpose. Then it would drop back to the leaf as if nothing had happened and resume its jerky racing up and down. Lastly, it would sit quite still like a rigid image. Maya watched its antics in the sunshine, then approached it and said politely, how do you do? Welcome to my leaf. You are a fly, are you not? What else do you take me for? said the little one. My name is Puck, and I am very busy. Do you want to drive me away? Why, not at all. I am glad to make your acquaintance. I believe you, was all Puck said, and then with that he tried to pull his head off. Mercy, cried Maya. I must do this, you don't understand. It's something you know nothing about. Puck rejoined calmly and slid his legs over his wings until they curved round the tip of his body. I'm more than a fly, he added with some pride. I'm a house fly. I flew out of here for the fresh air. How interesting, exclaimed Maya gleefully. Then you must know all about human beings. As well as the pockets of my trousers, Puck flew out dis disdainfully. I sit on them every day. Didn't you know that? I thought you bees were so clever. You pretend to be at any rate. Well, my name is Maya, said the little bee right, rather shyly, where the other insects got their self-assurance to say nothing of their insolence. She couldn't understand. Well, thanks for the information, whatever your name. You're a simpleton. Puck sat there, tilted like a cannon in position to be fired off, his head and breast thus forward and his hind tip of his body resting on the leaf. Suddenly he ducked his head and squatted down so that he looked as if he had no legs. You've got to watch out and be careful, he said. That's the most important thing of all. But an angry wave of resentment was surging in little Maya. The insult Puck had offered her was too much. Without really knowing what made her do it, she pounced on him quick as lightning, caught him by the collar and held him tight. I'll teach you to be polite to a bee, she cried. Puck set up an awful howl. Don't sting me, he screamed. It's the only thing you can do, but it's killing. Please remove the back of your body. That's where your sting is. And let me go. Please let me go if you possibly can. I'll do anything you say. Can't you understand a joke? A mere joke. Everyone knows what bees are the most respected of all insects and the most powerful and the most numerous. Only don't kill me, please don't. There won't be any bringing me back to life. God, no, what? no one appreciates my humour. Very well, said Maya, a touch of content in her heart. I'll let you live on the condition that you tell me everything you know about human beings. Gladly, Pluck, Puck replied. I'd have told you anyhow, but please let me go now. Maya released him. She had stopped caring. Her respect for the fly and any confidence that she might have had in him were gone. Of what value could the experience of a slow, a so low, so vulgar creature be of a serious-minded people? 
she would have to find out about human beings for herself. The lesson, however, was not wasted on Puck. He was, he was much more endurable now. Scolding and growling and set himself in rights, he smoothed down his feelers and wings and the minute hairs on, his, on the back of his body, which were fearfully rumpled, for the girl bee had laid on good and hard, and concluded the operation by running his body, um, his body in and out several times, something new to Maya. God, I'm all out of joint, completely out of joint, he muttered in a pained tone. Comes of your excited way of doing things, look. See for yourself. The suckling disc at the end of my body looks like a twisted peeler plate. Have you a suckling disc, asked Maya. Goodness gracious, of course. Now tell me, what do you want to know about human beings? Never mind about my body being out of joint, it will be all right. I think I'd best tell you a few, few things from my own life, you see. I grew up amongst the human beings, so you'll hear just what you want to know. You grew up among the human beings? Of course. I was in the corner of the room that my mother laid the egg which I came from. I made a f my first attempts to walk on their window sills, and I tested the strength of my wings flying from seizure to go uh, goofy. What are Seisha and Gothi? Statues, explained Puck. Very superior statues of two men who seem to have distinguished themselves. They stand under the mirror, one on the right and one on the left. And nobody pays any attention to them. What's a mirror and why do the statues stand under the mirror? A mirror is good for seeing your belly when you crawl on it. It's very amusing. When human beings go up to the mirror, they either put their hands up in the air or pull at their beards. When they are alone, they smile into the mirror. But if someone sees else is in the room, they look very serious. What is the purpose of this? I could never make it out. It seemed to be some useless game of theirs. I myself, when I was still a child, suffered a good deal from the mirror. I'd fly into it and of course be thrown back violently. Maya piled Puck with one more question about the mirror, which he found very difficult to answer. Here, he said at last, you've certainly flown over the smooth surface of water, haven't you? Well, a mirror is something like that, only hard and upright. The little fly, seeing that Maya listened more respectfully and attentively to the tale of his experiences, became a good deal pleasanter to his manners. And as for Maya's opinion of Puck, Although she did not believe everything he told her, she was still very sorry that she had thought so slight, slightly of him earlier in their meeting. Often people are far more sensible than we take them to be at first, she told herself. And Puck went on with his story. So it took me a long time for me to get to understand their language. Now at last I know what they want. It isn't much because they usually do the same thing every day. I can scarcely believe it, said Maya. Why, they have so many interests and think so many things and do so many things. Cassandra told me that they build cities so big that you can't fly around them in a day. Towers as high as um, the nuptial fl flight of our queen, houses that float on the water and houses that glide across the country on two narrow silver paths and go faster than birds. Wait a moment, said P Puck energetically. Who's this Cassandra? Who is she? And if I make maid so bold to ask. Oh, she was my teacher. Teacher, repeated Puck. Probably also a bee. Who but a bee would be so, uh, would overestimate being human beings like that? Your Miss Cassandra, or whatever her name is, doesn't know her history. Those cities and towers and other human devices you speak of are, none, are none, no good to us. Who would take such an impractical view of the world as you do? If you don't accept the premise that the earth is dominated by the flies, that the flies are the most widespread and the most important race on the earth, you'll scarcely get a real knowledge of the world. Puck took a few excited zigzag turns on the leaf and pulled at his head, to Maya's intense concern. However, the little bee has, had observed by this time that there wasn't much sense to be got out of his head anyway. 
Do you know how you can tell I am right, said Puck, rubbing his hands together as if to tie them in a knot. Count the number of people and the number of flies in any room. The result will surprise you. He may be right, but that's not the point. Do you think I was born this year? Man Puck demanded all of a sudden. Well, I don't know. I passed through a winter, Puck announced, all pride. My experiences date back to the Ice Age. In a sense, they take me through the Ice Age, and that's why I'm here. Whatever else you may be, you certainly are spunky, remarked Puck Meyer. Well, I should say so, exclaimed Puck, and made an airy leap out into the sunshine. The flies are the boldest race in creation. We never run away, unless it's better to run away, and then we always come back. So have you ever sat on a human being? No, said Maya, looking at the fly distrustfully out of the corner of her eye. She still didn't know quite what to make of him. No, I'm not interested in sitting on human beings. Ah, dear child, that's because you don't know what it is. If ever you had seen the fun I have with the man at home, you turn green with envy. I tell you, in my room there lives an elderly man who cherishes, cherishes the colour of his nose by means of, of a peculiar drink, which he keeps hidden in the corner cupboard. It has a sweet, intoxicating smell. When he goes, in, goes to get it, he smiles and his eyes grow small. He takes a little glass and he looks up into the ceiling while he drinks to see if I'm there. I nod down to him and he passes his hand over his forehead, nose and mouth to show me where to sit later. Then he blinks and opens his mouth as wide as he can and pulls down the shade to keep the afternoon sun from bothering us. Finally, he lays himself down on something called a sofa and in a short while begins to make a dull snuffling sounds. I suppose he thinks the sounds are beautiful. We'll talk about them some other time. They are a man's slumber song. For me, they are the sign that I am to come down. The first thing I do is take my portion from the glass, which he has left for me. There's something in tremendously stimulating about a drop like that. I understand human beings. Then I fly over and I take place on the forehead of the sleeping man. The forehead lies between the nose and the hair and serves for thinking. You can tell it does from the long furrows that go from right to left. They must move whenever a man thinks if something worthwhile is to result from his thinking. The forehead also shows if human beings are annoyed, but then the folds run up and down and a round cavity forms over the no nose. As soon as I settle in his forehead and begin to run into the furrow in the furrows, the man makes a snatch in the air with his hands. He thinks I'm somewhere in the air. That's because I'm sitting on his think furrows and he can't work out quite quickly where I am. At last he does. He mutters and jabs at me. <coughs> now then, <laughs> Miss Meyer, or whatever your name is, now then, you've got to have your wits about you. I see the hand coming, but I wait until the last moment, then I fly nimbly to one side to sit down and watch him feel to see if I'm still there. We keep the game up for a full half an hour. You have no idea what a lot of endurance that man has. Finally jumps up and pours out a string of words which show how ungrateful he is. Well, what of it? A noble soul seeks no reward. I'm already up and on the ceiling listening to his ungrateful outburst. say I particularly like it, said Maya. Isn't it rather useless? Well, do you expect me to extract a honeycomb from his nose? exclaimed Puck. You have no sense of humour, dear girl. What do you do that's useful? Little Maya went red all over, but quickly collected herself to hide her embarrassment from Puck. The time is coming, she flashed, when I should do something big and splendid and good and useful too. But first I want to see what's going on in the world. Deep down in my heart I feel 
but the time is coming. As Maya spoke, she felt a hot tide of hope and enthusiasm flood her being. Puck seemed to not realise how serious she was and how deeply stirred. He zigzagged about in his flurried way for a while, then asked, You don't happen to have any honey with you, do you, my dear? I'm sorry, replied Maya. I'm glad you let you have some, especially after you've entertained me so pleasantly. But I really haven't got any with me. I ask you one more question. Shoot, said Puck. I'll answer. I always answer. I'd like to know how I could get into a human being's house. You fly in, said Puck. But how, without running into danger? Well, wait until a window is opened, but be sure to find the way out again. Once you're inside, it can, it can be hard to find the window. But the best thing to do is to fly towards the light. You'll always find plenty of windows in every house. You need only to notice where the sun shines through. Are you going already? Yes, replied Maya, holding out her hand. I have some things to attend to. Goodbye. I hope you quite recover from the effects of the Ice Age. And with that, her fine, confident buzz that yet sounded slightly anxious, little Maya raised her gleaming wings and flew out into the sunshine across to the flowery meadows to cull a little nourishment. Puck looked after her and carefully meditated what might still be said. Then he observed thoughtfully, Well now, well well, why not? That's the end of the chapter. Let's see where she ends up next time.